2 Timothy is an amazing epistle. It's the last epistle that the Apostle Paul pens before he takes his last breath on earth. And by the way, when you do take your last breath, it followed will be your first breath in heaven. Amen? So before he takes his last breath on earth, he writes this incredible epistle from the heart within a dungeon. Paul, somewhere in his 50s, late 50s, is guesstimated, and there's been a lot of changes in Paul's life over the last three decades. If I could somehow sum up Paul's life, I would say it was a man who desired to do the will of God. I can't think of anything more important than to know and do the will of God. If you're ever wondering just how humble of a person you are, which Paul was definitely a very humble man, you can always gauge your level of humility, that incredible characteristic of God, by your desire to know the will of God. For example, do you get up in the morning and just go, I think I got my day planned out. I got this figured out. When you run into problems, which we do every day, are you quick to go, I got this. Are you more like the child that can't even take a step without daddy or mommy holding on to them? Completely dependent. See, if you want to know the will of God and walk in the will of God like the apostle Paul did, you've got to have this dependency saying every day, Lord, whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want it. And the Apostle Paul, all through his ministry, talked about the importance of the will of God in this last epistle, the first verse. Look at it. Bang, right here. 2 Timothy 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle one sent, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul's like, my whole life is about the will of God. We should be getting up every day and saying, Lord, here's my day timer. Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to call? Who am I supposed to pray for? What am I supposed to buy? What am I not supposed to buy? Everything is subjected to go, Lord, I just want your will because I'm just here representing you. I'm here sent to do your will, God, all because of Jesus. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, he said, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is in dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, the only way we can be like someone like Apostle Paul, who's just walking in the will of God, is instead of getting drunk with the wisdom of this world and fulfilled and satisfied in this world, which doesn't ever really fulfill and satisfy, is just to say, Holy Spirit, I need you to lead and guide me. The thing is, there was a time in Paul's life before the promise of Jesus Christ came into his life where he was convinced he was walking in the will of God. I think that's one of the scary places to be is when you think you're in the will of God and you've even got scriptures to back it up, but you're not in the will of God. That was not Paul, that was Saul before he actually encountered the life in Jesus Christ. Just a quick testimony about Paul or Saul's life, B.C. days, if you would, Acts chapter 9. Many of you know the story. It says, Saul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, Christians, whether men or women, he may bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed and he came to Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. In other words, it's hard for you to walk the right way when all you're doing is kicking rocks everywhere you're going. You're so angry, Paul, Saul, if you would. So trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, I love this. What do you want me to do? 
Talk about contrast. Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. What a 180 from Saul going, I got my roadmap, I got my agenda, I got my, my scriptures in the Torah, I'm going after these, these cult members and all of a sudden he gets knocked off his high horse, humbled to where now it's not about where I wanna go, when I wanna go, what I wanna do. Lord, whatever you say, that's what I'm doing. If you want to be apostolic, you want to find all the promises that are in Jesus Christ, you want to walk in the will of God, you've got to come to that place to go, Lord, whatever you say. Now, when we get saved, that's usually the thing. We come to, we say, Lord, if you don't want me to go to college, you don't want me to marry this person, you don't want me to drink that, you don't want me to watch that, you don't want me to talk like that, Lord, I just want to reflect who you are. But sometimes, you ever find that the longer you walk with Jesus, the more independent you become? Because you kind of know the Bible after all, you know. And, and you kind of got this thing down. You've got some notches on your belt. You've got some experience. It's called arrogance. And no longer are we fear, frightened, trembling before God, whatever you say. And here's the thing, and this is partly why we struggle with this, if we're honest, because we know when we say, Lord, whatever you want, we know what that means sometimes. Now, what did he say to Saul or Paul? He says, I want you to arise and go into the city, and there you'll be told what to do. You notice if you want the will of God, it's progressive. It's not like God's going to give you the whole roadmap for your life in one time of prayer. He gives steps. First, go in the city. I'll tell you what happens after you get there. And many times we're struggling to know the will of God because we haven't taken that first step of obedience that God said, well, just do this. That's one issue. The other one is many times when God tells us to go and trust his will, there's a conflict with what seems to be his will and what we believe would be his will. Paul had a rough time of it. He's writing this epistle from prison. What do you do when the will of God is that you're in prison? What do you do when the will of God is that it's suffering that you're going through? Now you go, but Dave, I've read the book of Acts. The apostle Paul, he, he, he had like a, you know, he was house arrest. That was the first time he was in prison. Then he went to Spain, and then he came back to Rome, and he got arrested. And this time, he's thrown in a dungeon. Matter of fact, he writes and says, can you bring me a coat or a cloak? Because he's in this dark, cold dungeon. He's got eye problems. Some speculate it's malaria. He's got issues. He's by himself. This is before he's going to be taken out of that dungeon and beheaded from Caesar Nero. The will of God led Saul to become Paul to arrive, to get knocked off the high horse of this world where he was drunk on the wine of this world to a trembling, incredible experience of worship with Jesus Christ that changed his life. He saw Jesus, guys, and it changed him. That's what happens, right? It changed him to the point where he's like, I don't gauge what is good and bad like the world gauges what's good and bad anymore. Was it a good thing that Paul went to prison and suffered? For you and I personally, it was a good thing, wasn't it? But the thing is, guys, many times the will of God initially looks like a punishment, difficulties, pain, loss, persecution from this world, rejection from this world. The time that he was living in was rough. It was around 64 AD that the Apostle Paul, the heat really got turned up literally. What took place was there was a persecution going on by Caesar Nero. And history tells us more than likely at the burning of Rome that it was actually Nero that burnt Rome down, but he blamed on the Christians. He said they're a bunch of pyromaniacs. They're they're talking about the light of the world. They're talking about being on fire, if you would. And so the story kind of goes that Nero was burning it down so he could rebuild it 
in the manner he wanted to rebuild it. Kind of like, interesting how history repeats itself if you look at our country right now. But he blamed it on the Christians, hence ultimately Nero beheaded Paul. But before that took place, church history teaches us that, that Paul met Nero. Now I have no doubt, like our young realtor here, he shared the gospel with Nero. Nero went nuts afterwards. This maniac would take Christians, thousands of them, turn them into human candles, hang them in his garden, and ride around naked in a chariot mocking God and the Christians. The guy was insane. And you know what the Roman government did about it? Nothing. Was that the will of God? Christians died like that? Clearly. It wasn't until a year after Paul died that the Senate finally goes, we're declaring Nero an enemy of the state. The guy runs away, takes off, and commits suicide, loses his mind. But he met the apostle Paul before that. In other words, Paul's life, all those missionary journeys, everything that was taking place, was all leading to this place to be a witness to the President of the United States. Is it okay with you that God, listen, would take you on some hard roads because he has an eternal purpose for you to be a light somewhere? I'm hearing our sister go, man, I got my eyes on Jesus. Sometimes marriage is difficult and some of the challenges that I have, but I, I, that Lord, you've never left me. I'm with you. I'm trusting you. I'm following you. I can see Paul going, I'm in this dungeon and it's dark and it's hard, but you're with me, Lord. You're with me. You're not going to hear one ounce of grumbling from the Apostle Paul in this epistle. No, God, why did you leave me? Why did you forsake me? No, this is the Lord's clearly moving in this man's life, radically changing him. And when I read this verse, this first verse that says, man, I'm apostle, I'm a believer by the will of God. It's God's will that I'm a reflection of who Jesus is in this world. A real Christian gets up every day and says, Lord, have your way in me. How can I be a Christian like that? How can I be someone to reflect the will of God? Listen to this verse that you know so well in Romans 12. The scripture says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Everybody say, view mercy. If you want to know the will of God, it starts there. If you want to have this heart that's hand over to say, your way, have your way. I trust you with all of my, the first thing you do is you get knocked off your high horse by viewing the Lamb of God. You, you, you wow. I see what you did for me. Who am I to say I want it my way? You're so humbled when you look at Jesus. Like when you go to the table and I see a few of you going to have communion tonight. Man, when you get that cup and that bread and you see what he did for you, how can you want to do anything else but his way? That's why Paul, the guy who loved the will of God here in Romans, the city he was executed in, he says, view God's mercy. And once you do, you know what you'll do? Look, offer your body as a living sacrifice. You want to know what God's will is? Look at Jesus. Look at what he did for you. Look at the lamb. And by osmosis, like a reflex, you're going to offer and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Have your way. You'll offer your body's living sacrifice, holy and pleasing God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, if you want to be like Apostle Paul, which who would not want to be, right? You want to be this mighty man, woman of God, sent apostolic, walking in kingdom authority, walking in the spirit, not drunk in the world. Then you just got to be like Saul. Look at Jesus, be humbled, offer yourself and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, I know I'm spending a lot of time on half of a verse, 
But I think it's really important that everything we're about to read in the following part of this chapter, you need to understand this is all basically a domino effect. This is a reflection of a man who was humbled. He saw Jesus. He was so humbled. He offered his body as a living sacrifice, and he walked in God's will. When you read all through the epistles, the book of Acts, he's like, and now knowing what awaits me in Jerusalem, I'm compelled, bound in the spirit to go there. Even though everything in his intellect and his body was saying, that's insane to do this, go here, give that, sacrifice that, in his spirit that was connected with the will of God, he was compelled to do the will of God. But some people, some Christians, they get up and they're just like, I got this. I got this figured out. If you want, see, here's the thing. We, a lot of us want to know what the will of God is. It usually starts like this. Who should I marry? I just need to know your will, Lord. Should I buy this car? I want to know your will, Lord. Those things are not the focal point of knowing as well. There's so much in the word that we read that we go, that's the will of God. We should walk in that. In other words, don't worry about what's going to happen in the city. Just go to the city. And that's what we see as we read through these few verses. We're just going to cover verses 1 through 12 tonight. You're going to see a man walking in the will of God. And I'm I'm like, Lord, can this be like an x-ray machine for us tonight to see if we're walking in your will? Are you guys ready for this? It's going to be a great passage. Look at this. Look at this man who's been transformed. Radical 180. He says to Timothy, a beloved son. The first thing he writes to this young protege Timothy, listen, it's the will of God that you have a Timothy in your life. How about that? I'm talking to this... uh, sister that comes to fellowship here and she's a waitress at a restaurant um, that Kathy and I like to go to and um, she's sharing with me how this older sister is like taking her, in her words, under her wing and is discipling her. In other words, she's like a Timothy. And I'm listening to this on the phone the other day and I'm like, man, that's awesome. I mean, everyone should have a Timothy or a Timothess, whatever, you know, Right? And, and it's so cool because we're sitting at the restaurant. And this is kind of a side note. I hate to get uh, rabbit trailed here, but it's, it's just a good story. And so we're sitting at the restaurant and we're, we're, and we're texting her and, and she goes, oh, so who's your waiter? And, and we tell her who the waiter is. And, and she goes, oh, love on him. In other words, she's being a witness to him, love on him. And she's, Kathy's reading the text out loud and I go, I go, man, we should pray for him. And I'm asking what the will of God is to pray for him because I don't know. We, we don't know what to pray for, do we? Unless we can go, well, I think, I know, we don't know. We ask, what is your will? And I'm asked, all I'm getting in my head is there's something with his dad we're supposed to pray for. Something's going on with his father. And so he comes to the table and Kathy goes, and I didn't tell Kathy we were going to pray. And Kathy goes, we'd like to pray for you. What can we pray for you about? And all of a sudden, he looks down and he goes, I haven't told anyone this, but I'm in a lot of pain right now because my dad just died. And, and I'm like, mm, wow. And now I'm like, should we just pray, Lord? Or should I share with him what you were sharing with me? And I begin to share with him that I was praying what to pray for, for him before he walked to the table. And as I'm telling this, tears just start rolling down his face because he's just like, Kathy, can we pray for you right now? She asked, oh, absolutely. It was just a God encounter, right? But it was just such a beautiful exercise for me having walked with Jesus since I was 18. I'm 55 now. My heart, I'm just being transparent with you, is like, I don't know what to pray. I need you to tell me, Lord, because you know this person's heart. You know what needs to be said. I don't know. I don't care how long you've been walking with Jesus, how much Bible knowledge you know. You don't know anything. You've got to get God to like intervene at, at that moment, every moment. Amen? And the thing is, all this never would have happened without this young female Timothy that says, hey, can you love on him, please? 
because someone older is investing in them. A lot of times we don't have the patience to invest in younger people. And I want to speak to some of those who are 40 and over. We don't want to invest in younger people because, ah, oh, those millennials, you know, the tattoos, the hole in their jeans, the music. They, I just can't relate to them. And, and plus, you know, they're just always making a mess of stuff. You know, there's a proverb somewhere, and I don't know exactly where I think it's Proverbs 14 or 4, but an empty barn is good, but it's unprofitable. A clean barn is good, but an empty one is unprofitable. There it is. In other words, if you're going to have a prophet, you're going to have a mess. In other words, if you're going to have a young Timothy, there's going to be challenges, annoyances, difficulties. You're going to have to exercise more patience than you would maybe someone your age. But it's the will of God that whatever God has invested in you, that you find someone younger than you and you pour into them. I believe that's God's will for everybody. That's why Jesus said, go make disciples. Amen? So the question is, if you want to walk in the will of God, versus going, Lord, what's your will about who I marry and where I work or where I go to school? How about go, what's your will of who I'm supposed to disciple? Who's my Timothy, Lord? And you might be 25. Well, then there's a 15-year-old somebody that you could be pouring into, hallelujah, amen? And many times that person is not going to be the person you think they would be. Timothy was, well, if you would, a half-breed, half-Jewish, half-Greek. According to Paul's culture, you don't associate with half-breeds. God says, he's not a half-breed to me. He's my son, Paul. And I want you to go pour in. And many times your Timothy might not be somebody that you think you have everything in common with or even particularly like all that much. But it could be God's perfect plan. And then at the end of it, you go, this is amazing. And all of a sudden, they might be calling up your pastor one day and saying, hey, I got an assignment for you to go minister to somebody. I love how the Holy Spirit used this young female Timothy to direct our steps who we were supposed to minister to. How rewarding is that? Amen? That's, that is Paul's heart. To Timothy, a beloved son, and I love this, not... not a means to an end, not a servant in my ministry. Oh, he's a beloved son. If you really want to mentor somebody, it's not just head knowledge. It's your life. It's your heart. It's who you are, blood, sweat, and tears, man. You're just walking with them in life. Amen? And that's Paul's heart for his Timothy. He is beloved, you see, a beloved son. He says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. He gives him this incredible greeting where he takes this, this Greek word, charis, and Hebrew word, peace and mercy, and he puts them together and he says, hey, I just you're my son, and I know, listen, it's God's will that you would have a daily diet of grace, getting what you could never earn, peace, a unity, a connection with God in spite of what the world's trying to do to disconnect it, and mercy. Uh, you're overwhelmed that you don't get what you deserve. If you want to know the will of God about the little things that are temporal, really daily dive into the daily things that are the will of God that are eternal. Does that make sense? In other words, versus going, but I need to know if it's your will if I do this or do that or go there. I promise you, if you put that on the shelf and you just go, Lord, I just am going to just take some intravenous dose of your grace today. I'm going to, I'm going to sing a song about your grace right now. I'm going to and just engage in the peace that I'm, I'm made right with the Father because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm just going to begin to thank you for that right now. And Lord, I'm going to thank you for the mercy that I don't get hell, though I deserve it. It's God's will that every day that that's just coming off our lips. We're enjoying that. I think many times we don't know the will of God on the temporal stuff because we're not embracing the will of God with the eternal stuff. And that's exactly what Paul's talking about. He's like, this is eternal stuff. Do you know we get to go diving in the deep end of grace, peace, and mercy forever? You don't have to have a job forever. That's just a temporary thing here. You don't have to pay taxes forever. That's just a temporary thing here. 
right? You don't have to comfort people in their mourning and their hurting or correct people on their sin or this. That's just a temporary thing here in heaven. That's just, that's not going to, right now, dive into grace, peace, and mercy that come from the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. If you want to know what the will of God is, check it out. You ready? That you have a pure conscience. You ever struggle with a guilty conscience? I've got good news for you, ready? That's not God's will. There's a difference between a guilty conscience and conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know the difference? I'm going to tell you. Shame is different. Because see, shame, when, when, when you're going through guilt... It's shame. You're looking at what you did as it defines you. When it's conviction of the Holy Spirit, it's more like you've stepped in something that's nasty and wasteful, but it doesn't define who you are, and you can be cleansed from it. Do you see the difference? It's the will of God as we serve God that we do with a clear, a pure conscience and a clean conscience, I would even say. And there's an easy way if you've got a an impure conscience, a guilty conscience, you're under conviction, I should say. There's this beautiful passage in 1 John 1 that says, hey man, all you gotta do is confess your sin to God. Isn't that great? I mean, I'm not talking about the whole confessional booth where I can say it, feel better, and then dive back into it. I'm talking about where you're going, you know what? I, I, I blew it. And you know what the beautiful thing is about confessing your sin? It helps lower the notch of your self-righteous gauge. <laughs> Doesn't it? Because how many times have you judged somebody for doing something in their hypocrisy or their sin, and then down the road you find yourself doing it? And then you look back when you were judgmental and you go, oh my gosh, Lord, how did you put up with me? I was so arrogant in my self-righteousness, and I was getting my my aunt my, my conscience was like being seared with an iron as paul says back in first timothy 4 it's like when you confess sin it humbles you and then you're able to serve god with a clean conscience and humility paul's saying i thank god that that's something to thank god for what do you think I thank God whom I serve. In other words, I'm thanking God that I'm not the Pharisee I used to be. See, Paul, who used to be Saul, he went around, he had the first five books of the, of the Old Testament, the Torah or the Pentateuch, I should say. He had it memorized. He murdered people who he believed were leading people astray away from Jehovah God. He considered himself to be perfect in righteousness, if you would. He was so self-absorbed, but many times you don't know when you're self-absorbed in self-righteousness. Do you know what I'm saying? You don't. It's not until God comes like he did Job. Everyone around Job thought he was, he's the most righteous dude on the planet, man. And then God comes and brings a whirlwind in his life. And then chapter 39 and 40 calls him out in his self-righteousness and exposes what was buried down deep. Because he was just looking, you ready? for confession. He was looking for Job to get something out of his life that didn't belong there. Pride, arrogance. Do you know that you can serve God with an impure conscience? If you're, you can tithe with an impure conscience, you can go evangelizing with an impure conscience. And that impurity for me, friends, is self-righteousness. Paul had been removed, so much of that had been removed from his life because he had been knocked off his high horse. Oh man, I love the humility of this guy. It's, it's encouraging and it's convicting. He says, I thank God that I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of, of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. Oh, I gotta stop there. There's so much, you can see this is so pregnant, right? So much stuff here. But he says, man, I thank God in prayer. How often? Night and day. 
This was the same guy in Thessalonians says, pray without ceasing. How do you know if you're someone who really desires the will of God? You're like always talking to God. And many times we don't talk to God all the time because we get impatient that we're asking and we're not hearing what we're asking for at the moment we're asking. But what's going on? God's trying to develop this character in us through this thing called patience. Where we're just talking to him, not so much because, Lord, I want to make a deal with you. I'm going to talk with you and I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast because I want to get what I want. The heart of a worshiper is, I just can't believe I get to talk to you right now. I can't, I can't believe that I can actually address my heart towards heaven and, and you're really listening to me. I, I don't need, you're, you're not a genie, God. You're not Santa Claus. I, I don't need to pray to ask you stuff and then you do it right then for me to find satisfaction in prayer. That's called a prosperity gospel. That's not real prayer. Prayer is just connecting and you sense that grace, that mercy, and that peace. And you're just talking to God. The greatest example of prayer in my life is my wife. She prays so much that it kind of convicts me that I don't pray enough. I'm, she's wanting to pray, and I'm like, we just did pray. Okay, she wants to pray again. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to focus on what I'm doing here, but she wants to pray again. Okay. <laughs> like, I guess I should pray more, <laughs> you know? But it's like, I love it when I see someone go, I just love talking to God. Why? Because there's this communion. See, Paul says, I'm mindful of your tears, Timothy. Timothy had problems. I mean, I, I, I got to tell you, Timothy was someone who, he was young, he was timid, he had physical problems, a weak body, maybe not someone that, someone might want to pick us as a protege, but to Paul chose, you see. And he had difficulties, and Paul he empathized. He was like, I'm mindful of your tears, and my heart's connected to your heart, and your problems, your struggles, they're my problems, they're my struggles. And, and how I'm walking with you is I'm night and day taking them to God with you. Man, don't you love this? You want to know the will of God? Be a picture of Jesus that carries his brother's burdens in prayer. You might start off going, why am I even doing this? God, you're not listening. I'm not seeing you act like I will think I think you should act right now. Man, just intercede. Just talk with God. Take whatever gift of a burden he's put on your heart for that Timothy. Lift it up, and I promise you will be, have a connection with the Holy Spirit that will be so incredible, it's beyond words. And here's the thing. If we have any addicts in the room, there's nothing better to be addicted to than prayer. Night and day, I remember you in prayer, he says about his young Timothy. I can't wait to meet Paul. How about you guys? Oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. He says, I, I call to remember your genuine faith, man. You're the real deal, Timothy. He says, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in you also. You want to know something that's the will of God? Raising godly children. Did you hear me? That is the will of God parents raise godly children. Man, Paul says, I am so grateful for your grandmother and your mother. Your dad, uh, he was a Greek polytheist, believed in many gods. He wasn't someone that was raising you up in the Lord. But man, your grandmother and your mom, they trained you up in the Lord. That is always the will of God that we say, okay, if I'm going to raise my kid, that's why God gives us kids. It's not so we can give them the same haircut we got send them to the same college that we went to so they can be in the same fraternity we were in. God gives us kids so we can be like a Hannah and say, they belong to you. Now, how do you know as a parent that you're doing that? When you're, when you're whatever standard and boundaries and freedoms that you're saying, this is the atmosphere of your life, they line up with the scripture. Do you hear me? 
That is the will. So you might be here today and say, I don't even, I'm not even married. Well, then you need to hear this because one day you might have a little Johnny or little Mary. Okay? And it, it, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great that one day that kid is raised up to be a Timothy that is a pastor of a church one day or a missionary or just some Christian that walks in the publics and leads cashiers to Jesus all because you raised them in the Lord? And more and more today, what I've seen in the last 20 years especially, honestly, guys, I more and more see parents take their kids and put them on the arms of Molech, if you would. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put them in a school that's going to teach them anti-God philosophies. I'm going to let them hang out with kids that are, that, that are into this whole gender insanity and influence them. Let them listen to the music that's anti-God and cultic and demonic. And just because I got my life and they got their life. And I see this happening to parents in the church. Eunice and Lois, they weren't like that. They raised a young man that pastored the most incredible church in Asia Minor in Ephesus, Timothy. How about that? I can't think of any greater legacy to have than say, I trained up my kids in the Lord. Now, with that said, I want you to know, parents, training your child up in the way of the Lord. The scripture says, when they're old, they shall not depart. That is a principle, not a promise. Understand the difference. There is no guarantees. You can have a Cain and an Abel in your house and raise them. That does not guarantee they're going to follow the Lord. Do you understand? In other words, God has no grandchildren. It's a direct relationship of repentance and following the Lord. We bring influence, but our decisions to raise our kids don't control their will. You understand? I wish I would have understood that in my 20s and 30s because I said, well, that's a promise. I'm going to raise them, Lord, so that I won't have any prodigals in my home. Boy, I learned that's not what that means. We do it not because it's a guarantee that everything will go great with our kids. We do it because we say they don't belong to us. They belong to you, Lord. And I'm going to raise them according to your word and train them up according to truth as you call truth. Amen. And I love this beautiful legacy and this praise that Eunice and Lois have here. He goes on to say, I remind you to stir up the gift of God that is in you, which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. Stir up the gift of God that is in you. Now remember, he's talking to Timothy, who was timid, fearful, insecure. What is the will of God? That whatever gifts you have, they get stirred up. That's kind of cool, right? Every, every time throughout the decades I've read that verse, the first thing that comes to my head is five years old with a Hershey's chocolate powder, and I got to stir up the bottom because it tastes much better. <laughs> and I go, that's what happens. It's like after a while, that stuff just settles to the bottom. I think our gifts, whatever they are, when they're not used, they just kind of settle. Kind of like muscles that you have. You don't use them. You know that stuff that starts to go flabby? It's just, right? Paul says, stir it up. Now, how do you stir that up? If you have a gift to prophesy, check it out. You got to open your mouth. You've got to be a person of prayer. Because if you're not a person of prayer and you open your mouth to prophesy, you're going to give people you and your opinion, and it will never work out. But if you're a person of prayer and brokenness and humility and there's a heart to connect with the heart of God for the will of God, for the people of God, and you say, what about the world? No, that's, that's preaching. I'm talking about prophesying to the body of Christ for edification, you see. You begin to open your mouth. What's going to happen is sometimes you're going to stumble over your words. You're going to say something God said, but that you're going to add your two cents in and it's going to cause a problem, a little bit of a mess. There'll be some fruit, some bruised fruit, some problems. And that's usually how it happens when you get to prophesy, and, and that can cause you to repel to using your gift. Anybody relate to what I'm saying here? Remember what I said about that proverb? And a clean barn is great, but it brings no profits. It's okay that things get a little messy using your gifts. It's kind of like praying in the Spirit, or it's just say praying in tongues. That's one of those gifts that... Do you know the Holy Spirit doesn't like make you pray in tongues? It doesn't happen like that. 
It wasn't like all of a sudden I'm trying to pray in tongues and the Holy Spirit's just making my mouth move and I'm out of control. That's called demon possession. <laughs> See, the spirit of the person using the gifts, 1 Corinthians 14, the, the gifts are subject to that person. In other words, your will is connected. It's kind of like preaching. Some person can have a gift of preaching. You can have a gift to preach, but the Holy Spirit doesn't make you get up, go in your car, go somewhere and preach, does he? You've got to stir it up by taking your will and saying, yes, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I'm willing to do it at any cost, including my dignity, including my fear of rejection of man. I'm not going to be intimidated from the rejection of man to let your gift shine. So he says to Timothy, stir it up, man. If you're having difficulties, you might be here tonight and go, I don't even know what my gifts are. Are they service gifts, Romans 12, like administration and, 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 and like helping people? A, a spiritual gift could be the heart of a servant, a gift of mercy, empathizing with people on a level that Paul talked about. You know, that was Romans 12, a gift of mercy, where he says, man, I remember your tears day and night. That's a spiritual gift. No, but there's manifestations, like in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, so there's these spiritual manifestations, there's spiritual gifts. And a lot of Christians today, we're like, I just don't know what mine are. So what do I do? Well, if you want to stir them up because you're not sure exactly what they are, the first thing I would say is begin to read your Bible. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, right? So it's kind of like if you're going to go play a ball game, you're like, well, where's my Red Bull? Where's my power bar? I need that extra little, because <laughs> I want to perform really good, right? If you want to walk out spiritual gifts in a way that's spirit-filled, you need faith. That's the gas in our tank. So say, you know what? Instead of watching Netflix, I'm going to read my Bible. Instead of calling that person to talk and gossip and slander or talk about video games, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to take a day and I'm going to not just pray, I'm going to fast. I'm going to deny myself of earthly satisfaction to my flesh because I'm saying, God, I'm hungry for you. And like Job, I value the words of your mouth more than my daily bread. And you start doing that, your faith grows. And then you, listen to this, you're going to love this. You start praying with your mind because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and he's moving and you're opening your mouth and you're praying things and you're like Paul. I'm praying specific things because my heart is empathizing, a spiritual gift for Timothy. But as you grow in that, this is what happens. After a while, you begin to pray so much with your mind, your conscious mind, it begins to be like that balloon that's about to pop. And, and your spirit's like, there's just more I need to pray, but it's beyond what my mind understands. And then you start to pray in the Spirit. Now, I know some of you are going, but Pastor Dave, 1 Corinthians 12 says that all, all of us pray in tongues, that whole rhetorical question. That's referring to the witness of the gospel in earthly languages. 1 Corinthians 14 teaches us that anyone can pray in the Spirit. In other words, you can pray in a way your spirit understands it's edified, but your mind does not understand what you're praying. Matter of fact, Paul says, no one understands what you're praying. So if it was like Acts chapter 2, where you've got a Jew praying in Swahili, so someone from Africa can understand the gospel, clearly someone would understand that tongue, right? That's not what he's talking about. That's tongues of men. He says, tongues of angels. He goes, I would have you all pray in the spirit because it goes beyond what your mind is thinking. That's a place that you actually grow to. How do you get there? You need to stir up your gifts. You begin to stir up faith by knowing why you believe what you believe in the word. Opening your mouth, Psalms 80, and watching God fill it with the things he wants to, I want to say pray through you, but prophesy through you. Because when you pray something, if it's from him, he already planned on doing it. Amen? It's never like you never gave God a good idea in prayer and he said, thank you. Right? He already knew what was going to happen, but when you're in the Spirit, then you're aligned with what he was already planning on doing. And then you get the temptation to be prideful, like, wow, check that, or go, or humbled that God spoke to you about what he was going to do. I like the latter. How about you? Right? So if you want to stir up those gifts, start in the Word. 
Stop eating the junk food that, that kills your appetite for the will of God, which the world does, right? Don't be drunk with wine, the things of the earth, because they'll dull you to the will of God. Make sense? And God has called us, sent us, to do the will of God, not our own will. And when he sends us, that's the beautiful thing, he's given us gifts. How incredible is that? This whole topic, which I know I'm kind of camping on a soapbox here for a minute, but I think some of us need to hear this. It's like this whole topic, you've got Christendom, one extreme where it's like, we don't talk about the gifts at all because we don't need the gifts of the Holy Spirit because we have the Bible. And you've got this other camp that says, let's just worship the gifts. And the Holy Spirit's not moving unless there's a prophetic word and someone's praying in tongues. And do you know, both of the extremes, we're not looking at Jesus. View mercy. Just look at the lamb. Have communion. Get a pure conscience, and I promise you, all of a sudden, you'll just be communing with God, and whatever gifts he wants to flow through your life, I promise you, in Acts 2, they weren't sitting there going, okay, we're waiting on the Lord because we're all going to pray in tongues. That wasn't happening. They weren't thinking about spiritual gifts. They were just loving Jesus, blown away by what he did, expectant that there is promises of life. He says, hey, wait for the promise I've got for you. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's all he said. He didn't say they were going to prophesy and pray in tongues. He just said, just wait on my will for you. And let go, and in that waiting, you're going to die to the faith in your will and your plan and be more sold out and surrendered to my will and my plan. And when that happens and you're decreasing, I'm increasing, all of a sudden spiritual gifts become like this, you know, just a reflex. That's the way it's supposed to be. But when someone says, you got to go to the school and learn this, or, hey, come on, repeat after me, my mama got a new Honda. Come on, say it really fast. My mom, yeah, it's just, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing, and it's artificial. It's not organic. It's not natural. It's not of the Spirit. God doesn't make it really complicated for us. I'm grateful for that, aren't you? But he did say, there's this part of this thing we initiate. He says, Timothy, you need to stir this up in you, which you guys are here tonight doing that very thing. He says, I want you to stir up this gift of God that was given through the laying on of my hands. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Was there something magical about Paul's hands? Was there something supernatural? Or was it a point of contact? I'm going to go with the latter. There's nothing magical about water you're baptized in, nothing magical about oil that you're anointed in, but there is this point of contact. When, when you see someone come and they lay their hands on you, that, that's a step of faith. That's a point of contact. I'm believing that when I'm putting my hand on you, God's hand is touching you. Does that mean something? Yeah, it does. That's why the scripture is really clear about the laying on of the hands and elders in James 5. There's something about, you ever had somebody pray over you and right where they're touching you, you just sense a warmth on your body? What is that? Is, that? is that psychosomatic? Is it their body temperature and you were cold? Or is it something of the spirit? I say, where's the fruit? How about that? Is there fruit? Was there a healing? Was there some, not just physical, was there emotional healing? Did, was, there some, was there revelation? Well, then praise God for that and realize that it's something biblical. Here's the thing, here's the caution. Don't chase after experiences. Chase after understanding of his heart for you. Because as soon as you chase after experiences, you've entered in from Christianity, you've entered into idolatry. So be careful. So don't take either extreme with this kind of stuff. Amen. Guard your heart with that, and the word of God will always help you in that endeavor. He goes on to say, for God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Timothy, you don't need to be afraid of obeying God. I love this. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ." who has abolished death, hallelujah, and brought life. Somebody say life. <laughs> and 
immortality to light through the gospel to which I was appointed a preacher. Now he says, I'm a preacher. Is he an apostle or a preacher? Yes. Now why is preaching so important? Because when someone preaches, they're, they're, they're sharing the gospel. See, a lot of churches, I, I always have people that come in and visit times real and they go, you know, I'm learning about the Bible. Where I was going to church, I, I, I heard the gospel a lot and there was a lot of invitations and, and a lot of talk about that Jesus died on the cross and, and he forgave us for our sins. That's called preaching. That's how people get saved. But when Christians just hear preaching and not the teaching of the word, they're really shallow in their understanding of the will of God. You understand? So Paul's talking about preaching. Who's he talking about speaking to? Unbelievers. Whenever you're in a fellowship and you're getting lots of preaching and not teaching, you're not going to grow. You'll be the shallow howl of Christianity, okay? That's just what happens. And that is typical, particularly in the United States of America. And that's why when you read about the office gifts in Ephesians 4, the fivefold ministry, you'll hear that there's, there's not only apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and what? Teacher, right? And so inside, if you want a healthy diet for growth, you're going, do I see those elements and those office gifts working in my life? Not necessarily that I'm all those things, but do I see those gifts affecting my life and cultivating me as a believer? Really important. So he says, hey, God has sent me as a preacher, an apostle, which means sent, and there we go, a teacher of the Gentiles. Why? Because they had no clue who God was. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Closing thoughts on this passage, guys. The Apostle Paul, remember the context. This man is in a dungeon. He's about to die. And all he is declaring is that his life is all about the will of God. He's not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed of the chains. In other words, this is not because God has rejected me or because I'm in sin. This is part of God's plan for me. He created me to be right where I'm at for a purpose that's beyond anything I can even understand. How can us as a believer go through chains and difficulties and sufferings and hardships and have that kind of heart of worship for God? Check it out. You do this in remembrance of him. If you continue to view mercy on what he did for you and me on the cross, You'll never despise what dungeon he might have you in. And remember, it's only temporary. And there's an eternal purpose in it. He said to his kids in the dark dungeon of Babylon in Jeremiah 29, I know the thoughts that I have and I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord. Christian, if you want to know the will of God, repeat these things after me. Number one, view his mercy. Come on, say it like you mean it. View his mercy. If you want to know the will of God, number two, Offer yourself. Number three, you'll be transformed. Remember what happened to Paul? He went from Saul to Paul because he saw the mercy of God. He offered himself and he was metamorphosized. Complete different. And when that happens, check it out. You're going to know the will of God. You will know what steps you're supposed to take, who you're supposed to pray for that day, where you're supposed to go, where you're not supposed to go, what, who you're supposed to witness to, how you're supposed to witness to them. You could be like so in the spirit that when you're witnessing somebody, God gives you this word of knowledge like he did Jesus for the woman at the well because you're just in step with the spirit. And I got good news for you, ready? That is the will of God, that we walk and stir up our gifts in that way. All we have to do is stop drinking the wine of this world, amen? Don't be drunk with this world. 
just say, Holy Spirit, I need you to come and bring a daily catharsis. And I, and I know I'm going to be welcoming that because I'm just going to love your grace. I'm going to love your peace. I'm going to love your mercy. I'm going to be open to a young Timothy in my life. You start having that heart, I promise you, no matter where God leads you, whether it's Rome or Jerusalem, whether it's a boss that seems like the spawn of Satan, whether it's a spouse that you're convinced will never get saved, whether it's a kid that you think is Damien from the Omen, you know, whatever, whatever it is that God brings you into, I promise you, you'll be like Paul in that dungeon giving God glory. In Jesus' name, amen.